This cannot be good. This was what Captain Vernon Gillespie said to a National Geographic author in 1965 in the Central Highlands of Southern Vietnam when they saw star clusters, red flares, popping up all around their base camp, their A camp, where the small team of Green Berets were living with an indigenous tribe of Montagnard uh, Highlander tribesmen and Vietnamese Special Forces. These flares had popped up all over the A camp and it was not looking good because what those flares meant basically was that the other A camps and the other mountains where other Special Forces teams were were being overrun. These were the, these were the signals, the pre-designated signals that Green Berets would pop up whenever they were in duress and it was clear that a lot of other A camps were in duress at this moment and the reason was because the Montagnard tribesmen across the Central Highlands were revolting. They were revolting against the government of South Vietnam. They were revolting against their partners, the American Special Forces. And the reason was because there was a long-standing tension between the Montagnard tribes and the Vietnamese government, the South Vietnamese government that had finally bowled over to a head and a lot of these camps had revolted. And this was bad because if this happened to the degree that it was happening, then in 1965, there was a very good chance that the Central Highlands would collapse and go over to the North Vietnamese and that America would lose the war. And at the time, remember now, we were doing pretty well in Vietnam. So this was a huge strategic threat to what was going on in the country of Vietnam and the war effort there by the Americans. Now, this Captain Vernon Gillespie that saw all of this happening and had this National Geographic author with him, you know what he did at that moment? He told his teammates on the team to start preparing the ammunition dunk, uh, bunker for destruction. He told his team to start preparing for escape and evasion like the other camps were having to do. But then he assembled all of the Montagnards, he assembled all of the Vietnamese Special Forces, both groups hated each other, and he said, listen, I am the leader of this Special Forces team. And he looked at the Montagnards and he said, if you assault these Vietnamese Special Forces, you'll have to kill me first, right? And then he pulled the leaders together from both groups and he explained to them that they had to find a way to work together. One of the tribal leaders suggested a tribal ceremony. Now imagine this, right? The place has fallen apart. The tribesmen are about to revolt and Captain Gillespie, instead of grabbing his gun and fighting and putting down the revolt, he listens to this tribal leader. These guys go put on loincloths, right? They walk into the tribal hut, they drink some rice wine, and they have a friendship ceremony where they exchange bracelets. Sound crazy? Well, guess what happened? As soon as that happened, it was a mandated friendship between the Vietnamese special forces that were in that camp and the Montagnard tribesmen. In other words, they couldn't fight each other. So they were unified, and then they got on the radios, they called their counterparts, they marched into other A camps, and they put down the rebellion from the bottom up, from the inside out. And the rebellion was crushed or quelled without many shots even being fired. All because one special forces captain had the common sense to meet people where they were, not where he wanted them to be. You see, things were going south in that camp, his tendencies, his fight or flight principles were to probably pick up his weapon and defend the camp like the other camps were doing, but that's not what he did. He recognized that he needed to meet the Montagnard leader where he was and get a sense of what was really going on. This is a powerful, powerful step that we've learned in Special Forces that you can use in your life. I don't care what the situation is, whether you run a nonprofit, whether you work in a Fortune 100 company or you're a school teacher. If you can meet people where they are, not where, you, they want, where, not where you want them to be, it is a powerful, powerful tool for leadership and for changing the game in your life. On December 7th this week, um, the second edition of Game Changer Citizen Guide is coming out. And um, I'm really excited about it because it really is written more for civilians because I believe an activated citizenry is what it's gonna take to finally defeat Islamist violent extremists and end what is now becoming a 16 year war. Um, and in the book, uh, Game Changers, there are several principles that we as Green Berets learned 
in or relearned in these rough villages. And one of them is meet them where they are. That's the theme for this week. Meet them where they are, not where you want them to be. And I'm going to put this out across all platforms. And I'd really like you guys to think about this theme in your own life, um, in your own business, especially if you're creating movements, if you're trying to get customers to buy from you, if you're trying to impart your vision on your employees, right? Um, if you're trying to get investors to, to buy into your startup, or you're trying to raise money for a nonprofit, any kind of movement where you need people to follow you because they want to, not because they have to, and where trust is somewhat depleted, this approach is extremely powerful. Meet them where they are, not where you want them to be. It's essential to changing the game, whether it's a dusty village in a tribal shura room or a spit and polish corporate boardroom. The principle is the same. Now, there's a few steps for meeting people where they are that are in my book, and I want to talk about them here for a few minutes. They are, uh, and I'm looking over at my redneck teleprompter over here, if you're wondering why I'm looking over, right? Wes won't get me like one of the nicer teleprompters. He gets me this bullshit whiteboard that I got to look at. But the, the first one is appreciate human domain. Uh, the second step is define relative stability. The next is to identify sources of instability. The fourth is to identify resilient actors. And the fifth is to pick out or identify the bottlenecks. Let me talk just a little bit about each one of those. So appreciate human domain, right? This is, everywhere you look, we're surrounded by people. Pretty much every problem we face in life is a people problem. Humans are the most social creatures on the planet, yet we seldom fail to appreciate the human domain of realities that are right around us. If you spend any time with me, you know I'm always talking about uh, understanding trust, looking below the waterline, talking about the fact that humans are the most meaning-seeking creatures on planet, that we're on the planet, that we're wired for emotion, we're wired for struggle, we're wired for story, over and over again, because that's where people live. And if you're going to meet people where they are, you have to be able to, to understand and appreciate the human domain. Captain Gillespie did. He understood that it wasn't just Vietnamese special forces in the camp, and it wasn't just special forces from America in the camp. There were these tribesmen in the camp, and he understood that the tribesmen around the highlands were revolting because of something they thought was important, right? And it probably didn't seem important to a lot of Americans, but Gillespie appreciated the human domain enough to know that he needed to listen to them, that there were emotions at play here. It ended up being a friggin' friendship ceremony that put the, the, re, the rebellion down. But because he appreciated human domain, all of it, and, and, and looked below the waterline at what was going on, he was able to be relevant and recognize an opportunity. Uh, defining relative stability. You know, that's kind of a big phrase. I, you know, in, in the book Game Changers, I use it to tell leaders, look, before you go into a place like Afghanistan and, you know, bring a Jeffersonian democracy, hi, I'm from the government, how you like me so far, to a bunch of 7th century tribal folks, maybe you ought to know what right looks like in the first place, right? Before you go in, and start running your suck about all the great change that you're gonna bring, maybe we take an extra second and we understand what right looks like in the eyes of the people in the human domain, in the eyes of the people who are relevant to the movement, right? So if you wanna create a nonprofit that does X, Y, Z, what does right look like on that? What do people expect in their minds, right? Take the time to ask some questions and really dig into that because if we don't understand what right looks like from the beginning, then we bring our own biased viewpoint from the top down, and guess what? People can't buy into that. They can't latch on to that, and they will not follow that. So you're essentially wasting your time. So defining what stability looks like, defining what right looks like inside your organization, talk to people on the shop room floor, talk to your associates, get a sense of what right looks like from the inside out. Number three, Identify sources of instability. What is it that's causing instability in your organization? Captain Gillespie had to talk to the Montagnard tr uh, tribal leader. He had to talk to the Vietnamese Special Forces tribal leader. He had to talk to his own teammates, right, before he could get a real sense of what the source of instability is. And you're, it's never going to be what you see on the surface, right? It's usually going to be below the surface. It's usually going to be some kind of simmering tension emotion, revenge, resource scarcity, the primal mammal stuff that makes us all tick that we all pretend like isn't there, right? That we all pretend like we're above and we're civilized and we don't do that shit. Yeah, well, that's exactly 
what the sources of instability are. How is this going to affect my job? Am I going to be able to feed my family? Am I going to lose my position of status if I, if I go along with this? Do you see what I mean? Right? What is it that's destabilizing the organization? Have we had a turnover in leadership? Right? If you don't identify the sources of instability, you're not going to be able to address the problem and you're not going to be able to restore what right looks like and you're not going to be able to, to, to meet people where they are. So what are the sources of instability inside your organization, outside your organization? And that takes uh, listening. It takes leaning in and really dialing in and being intentional. And frankly, you may not like some of the answers you're going to get, so get ready. Um, the fourth one is to leverage resilient actors. Now, you know, again, a big phrase in this sense, what I'm talking about is, you know, a lot of times the leaders in a community in Afghanistan and places like that or Vietnam, the leaders aren't, they don't have titles. They, they don't necessarily have a formal position, but guess what? They're very influential. They're very resilient. They're very powerful. They have WASTA. They get things done. Just because, see, in, in contract society, in our world, we think if you, if you, the only way you can lead is if you have a title. The only way you can get something done is if you have a formal position. Well, that's just not true in 90% of places around the world. And frankly, it's not true in your organization either. Think about a lot of the people in your outfit who have a title. They're crappy leaders, right? But there are people who don't have titles in your organization who are resilient who are quiet, but yet from the shadows, they can get things done. They have credibility and respect and legitimacy, right? Those are called resilient leaders. They're often kind of hiding in the shadows. They often kind of hang back, right? And they don't show themselves when the boss man's around or when he's walking the floor, but you better believe they're there, right? And if you can identify those resilient leaders like Captain Gillespie did with Huang Yi, I think it was Huang Yi was his name, the Montagnard tribal leader, who, you know, by all rights and purposes, is not the guy you would talk to when the camp is falling apart. But he did. And he recognized that he was the resilient leader who really had the solution. This guy had the legitimacy. He had the credibility. As crazy as a friendship ceremony sounded, if Huang Yi said afterwards, hey, we did this friendship ceremony and it's all good, then this guy's legitimate across all Montagnard tribal lines. It's the same in your organization. It's the same if someone on your shop room floor validates your vision and slaps the table and says, yeah, this is good, then it carries a lot of weight, right? So who are the resilient actors in your organization and are you leveraging them? Do you have relationships with them? And one last thing, don't try to go to them when you need something. You've got to build these relationships when risk is low, not high. And you've got to establish trust and relationships before the transaction. That's how it goes. And then the final piece is identify bottlenecks. Right? I define bottlenecks as those, you know, in, in, in organizations and in movements, you have relationships and there are tensions in these relationships that can jam up positive action, that can jam up movement, they can just bottleneck it. Um, in this sense, you had a tension between, a very specific tension between the Vietnamese special forces and the Montagnard tribesmen. That was a bottleneck. And unless that bottleneck was resolved through a tribal friendship ceremony that freed up that relationship and then allowed others around it to see that that bottleneck was reduced, no one was going anywhere. Well, the same can be true on your shop room floor. The same can be true in your nonprofit. The same can be true with your clients who are looking at your new product skeptically. You've got to run the scenes from top to bottom, side to side, left to right, and really get into the trenches, go local, meet people where they are, ask questions, and find out what are the bottlenecks. What's really going on in the organization that's jamming it up? And then, as the leader, take whatever steps are necessary, formal or informal, status or contract, right? Make emotional payments, atonement, whatever needs to be done, reciprocity, to free up that bottleneck and allow the natural flow to reestablish. That is what leaders do. That's what Green Berets do in the most dangerous places on earth, and it's what leaders like you should do when it's trust depleted organizations and environments here at home. And it works, those steps work. I saw recently the leader of a commercial bank, I'll call him Dave, he did a very similar thing. Um, they're, they're trying to assert the role of women in this organization more than what they've been doing. There are so many talented women in this organization who are not rising up to the levels of leadership that they could, not on an affirmative action level, but just it's not, an, it's not a good playing field, right? So the president of this bank sat down with 25 women in a room, just him, 
and he did exactly what Captain Gillespie did in that South Vietnamese uh, A camp, right? He, he met them where they were. He got an appreciation for the human domain. He defined what right looks like by listening to them. He identified what the sources of instability were and the reasons that they felt like that a lot of the playing field was not an even playing for the field for them to assert and to lead strong. He leveraged the resilient actors in the room. He saw who the real players were, many of whom he, had, he didn't realize because they were kind of in the shadows, right? And then once he identified those bottlenecks, he ran the seams of his organization top to bottom, right to left, and started freeing them up. That's leadership. That's rooftop leadership. That's how you change the game, and that's how you meet people where they are. It takes longer. I'm not going to lie to you. It's harder, but the results are strategic, and they are game-changing. I hope that these lessons helped you. I hope that you'll consider them in your own organization, whatever it is, especially if you're leading a movement. If you're trying to move people to action to do something, not because they have to, but because they want to, this is a great way to do it, all right? Um, a reminder that Game Changers is coming out on December 7th. It's going to be available on Amazon in both Kindle and hardcover. I'll be talking about it all week long uh, on my Instagram, uh, rooftop underscore leader. I'll be talking about it on Twitter uh, at Real Scott Man. I'll be talking about it on Facebook at Official Scott Man. And of course, our website, rooftopleadership.com. All kinds of different lessons and thoughts coming out this week on our theme. But just reminding you, meet people where they are, not where you want them to be and the results will be strategic. I'll see you on the rooftop.